She was also very involved with uh, Kate Fairman's campaign to get the rights of the terminally ill bill passed uh, last year. And she subsequently stood as a, a long euthanasia party candidate for the Senate in last year's federal election and amazingly managed to get over 15,000 first preference votes. And that was, you know, with so little preparation and was just sort of something that was done in the short term. So she did brilliantly in a very short campaign and Shane has been working tirelessly um, basically since she decided that she was going to stand for the New South Wales election as a VP member. She's one of the most passionate, energetic and hard-working people you are ever likely to meet. And we're all hoping that she will be the first member of parliament representing the Bob for Euthanasia Party, um, which is going to happen, uh, which is coming up in the New South Wales Upper House uh, in 2015 in March. So I'd like you to all welcome Shane Peterson. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, first, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to have been asked to speak here today. Um, I'm, I know that uh, many of you have been involved in the campaign for voluntary assisted dying for many decades, but I'm relatively new to the issue. Um, I'm sure that when the committee were looking for guest speakers for last year's AGM, my name would not have been on their list. But over the past 12 months, this has become the most important challenge in my life. As you know, uh, Sarah mentioned, I'm now head of the Voluntary Euthanasia Party in New South Wales, and I've also been endorsed as the lead set, uh, candidate for next year's state election. And it's a bit bizarre, really, seeing that I never had any political ambition. As Sarah mentioned, I'm a photographic artist. So what happened to bring me to this point? Well, some of you may know, I'm sure you do know, that my uh, beautiful mum died at the end of 2012 from an ag aggressive brain cancer. She was a vibrant, positive person and she loved life. She accepted that there was nothing uh, doctors could do to cure her cancer and she knew she had less than 12 months to live. But what she did expect was that doctors would help her at the end stages of her illness. Before it gets ugly, she said to her neurologist following the diagnosis. But this did not happen and like so many others I now know, she was forced to endure, endure a traumatic and undignified end to what had been a wonderful life. Just 15 days before mum died, she pleaded with everyone to end her suffering. The GP, our GP, the palliative care team, her partner Rod and my sisters and I. But there was nothing any of us could do. One of the excuses that opponents give as a reason for not supporting law reform is that if patients have access to good palliative care, they won't need to ask for a medically assisted death. Mm. This may be true for some patients, but not all. Our family took care of mum at home, and we were supported by a community palliative care team attached to a top Sydney hospital. So mum had good palliative care, obviously, in supporting the family. But when mum reached the end stages of her brain cancer, we were told the only way that she could achieve the peaceful end that she wanted would be to be admitted to a hospice. Now, right from the beginning, mum had said that she did not want to go into a hospice and we had promised her that she would not have to. I was happy to take care of her full time and that's what I did. Um, but, and I also promised uh, that I would be with her until the end and that I would not let her suffer. But with no other alternative, we felt we had no choice. Rather than a hospice, though, we took mum to a private hospital. And fortunately, the staff there were lovely, and they allowed my younger sister and I and her partner, Rod, to stay with her in the hospital. I did not know what it was called at the time, but now I know what they were able to provide in the hospital was terminal sedation. The fact that there is this option available to some patients is another reason given for not supporting medically assisted dying. But again, I can say from mum's experience that this is, this is not a peaceful or dignified way to die. It took five days and during that time mum had a massive seizure and she suffered pain and other distress. It was during those five long days that I wrote down everything that was happening to mum. I sat on the mattress on the, uh, on the floor in the toilet, that's where I slept at night, um, and just before dawn each day, I just wrote things down. 
uh, I was just so distraught. I could not believe what was happening, and I knew right then that I would do everything that I could to, to change the law when it was over. So Mum died on the 27th of November 2012. I'm sorry, I have got distracted with uh, the speech, probably a little bit nervous, and uh, that was, that's, that's my mum, that was my mum. A few, a few months later, I heard on the radio that Kate Fairman was introducing the rights of a terminally ill bill into the New South Wales Upper House, and I wanted to help, so I rang her office and I spoke to a staff member, so Jan's story became number 248 out of 500 personal stories that were sent to all the MPs in the New South Wales Parliament. Shortly after that, I was also asked to take part in a short video that was uh, actually produced by Dying with Dignity New South Wales, and that too was sent to all the MPs. Then on the day that the bill was introduced, I appeared in a television report on the ABC Evening News. I remember feeling around that time that it was all meant to be. This was the reason why my beautiful mum had suffered such an awful end and why I had to witness it all. I really, I suppose I was, um, I felt that I was playing a part and that we would achieve law reform in May last year. I, I was quite naive. I just thought that of course the bill would be passed. Why wouldn't it be? What had happened to mum was wrong and surely with such a well-drafted, humane bill, the lawmakers, our elected representatives, would listen to the vast majority of Australians, show compassion and change the law. But when I saw the story on the television that night, I was so disappointed when the reporter commented at the end that there was little chance that the bill would be passed. Over the next few weeks, I devoted nearly all my time to emailing and phoning all the politicians, particularly the, well, the ones in the upper house. I called Talkback Radio for the first time in my life. I attended Parliament when the bill was being debated, and I sent off more emails to counter the arguments put forward by opponents. Everyone warned me, including Richard, of course, um, that the bill would not pass, but that did not prevent my disappointment on the day when it was defeated 23 votes to 13. Following that vote, Kate Fairman met with supporters of the bill, and that is when I met someone who is now a dear friend, Loredana Alessio Mulhall. I'm sure all of you know about Loredana, and she's here today, which is wonderful, and the fact that she is at the end stages of multiple sclerosis. She was so amazing on that day, and despite the defeat, she just said she was not giving up. And uh, I promised on that day that I would not give up either. Within a few months, another opportunity presented itself when I became the lead uh, New South Wales Senate candidate for the newly formed Voluntary Euthanasia Party. I wasn't exactly sure what would be expected of me, but I did know that I was willing to give 100% of my time and effort to that campaign. And that's sort of what I did. <laughs> it was a pretty uh, interesting time, and I know that I've, I've spotted a number of the volunteers that helped on election day um, that have come here today. So once again, I know I've thanked you before, but once again, thank you very much. So uh, it was uh, an interesting time with uh, no staff. I basically had to run my own campaign, but with the moral support and guidance from members of Dying with Dignity, such as Richard Mills, Sarah Edelman, Gabriel Brown, Jill Weeks, David Leaf and others, um, I managed to learn a lot in a very short time and it was uh, sort of a crash course in uh, voluntary euthanasia history. Uh, but I think what gave me strength and confidence to speak to anybody about this issue was the fact that I had my personal experience. No one will ever convince me that what happened, the way my mum died, was compassionate, humane or dignified. Terminal, terminal sedation in the end was not peaceful. Mum did suffer and the staff clearly was clearly scared uh, of hastening her death. And, and that's just not acceptable. I know I'm not the first one to say it, but we can do so much better than that. As I said, I worked non-stop during the seven weeks leading up to the federal election in September, and we needed two candidates to run uh, as a party above the line, so I was pleased when Loredana agreed to be the second candidate in New South Wales. 
In the end, as Sarah mentioned, we uh, achieved nearly 15,000 votes, which was good for such a new minor party. When I worked on, I, did, I worked at uh, Double Bay, Malcolm Turnbull's, um, uh, in fact, I was working, handing out brochures for a short time beside Malcolm, but uh, um, the, yeah, the, it was, uh, it was an interesting day and uh, the, the people came out on that day out, out the gate and you know how most polling booths, it was a school, there's one gate in and there a few different entrances so people were coming out and saying I didn't even know there was a party called Voluntary Euthanasia, I would have voted for you so I, I know we're going to have to do a lot better um, <coughs> next year in the state election but we've got a lot longer to get the message out. So uh, during uh, the federal campaign, a man named Barry Shine, who's here today, uh, contacted me when he made a donation. He told me that he was a retired businessman who had a lot of experience with fundraising and he'd be help happy to help me or meet with me after the election to discuss future strategies for the Voluntary Euthanasia Party. Uh, I met Barry and I told him that I intended to pursue the registration of the VEP in New South Wales and he agreed to help me. With the support of the VP's federal executive and once again members from Dying With Dignity, we established a foundation executive committee and started the process of registration. As you know, because all of you who are members of Dying With Dignity uh, received a letter last November, we needed 750 uh, members in New South Wales and we only had a few months to complete the registration process. I have, have to say that I was absolutely thrilled by the response. So many of you joined the Voluntary Euthanasia Party. By December, we had uh, just uh, under 1,100 declarations to submit to the New South Wales Electoral Commission. And now I'm happy to say that we've actually got over 1,500 members in New South Wales. So we've got a really, really pleased about that. As you know, uh, registration was completed. I was a little bit nervous. It was looking, we, they actually, I don't know if you all were aware, but they uh, had a um, uh, part of the process once they got the declarations in and they sent you all a survey, which you then had to fill out again and send back, and you all did that very quickly, which is fantastic. Um, they put a notice in the paper and they give 14 days for objections. And uh, on day 13, I spoke to the con my contact in the Electoral Commission to say, oh, we're looking good. And she said, and she said no, yes, there's no objections. The next day, no, I, I did wait at the next day, like the day after, and she said there's been an objection. So I knew that there was no, they had no legitimate grounds for objecting. There's very three specific areas, and we definitely, you know, checked all, checked all the boxes but I still got nervous. The others were reassuring me, don't worry, it'll take time. But I knew that we had cut it very fine with the registration process. So um, I was very relieved uh, when I got the, um, uh, the email saying that we were registered. So uh, where, to, where to from here, I suppose? Well, I'm, I'm excited about the challenge that lies ahead in the next 12 months. For the first time uh, in New South Wales, voters will, can show their elected representatives that they're not happy uh, by the fact that they continually ignore moves to introduce laws to allow uh, medically assisted dying. One of the most disappointing aspects of last year's defeat of the rights of the terminally ill bill was that an amendment that would have sent the bill to a cross-party committee was also defeated. We know that there are at least some members of the Liberal and National parties who do support medically assisted dying, yet not one single um, member voted for that bill or the amendment. One Liberal MLC actually told me that he did support the issue, but there was no way he was going to let that woman, meaning Kate Fairman, uh, get all the credit and help her get to Canberra. So you can imagine how upset I was. I mean, this is just a few months after my mum had passed away. It was very fresh for me. And to hear someone say that they would not support the bill, an issue that they did support, but, that, but simply because it was introduced by the Greens, I was disgusted, uh, just as I'm sure that um, all those people that lobbied so hard in Tasmania uh, late last year must have been disgusted when there too not a single liberal, liberal member of the Tasmanian Parliament supported their voluntary assisted dying bill late last year. And their, their one came so close, just one vote would have made the difference in Tasmania, so much closer than New South Wales. Oh, wrong back, I must have gone back on.
Hmm? Missing one. Oh, I'm missing a slide. Never mind. Um, so, you, and you, well, I actually had a slide up of the cartoon that was in um, uh, the Diamond Dignity newsletter. It was just the one about the conscience vote, so most, a lot of you would have seen it anyway. Um, you might have also uh, seen an open letter that Marshall Perron wrote to uh, the Liberal leader, Will Hodgman, who is now the Premier of Tasmania. In it he said, you commenced with an attempt to convince the audience that Liberal Party members were allowed a conscience vote on the bill. You know and I know that was a lie. We both know how power operates in political parties. You will recall telling me the Liberal Party is a broad church during our meeting on this issue. It seems odd then that 100% of your members genuinely hold a view contrary to one shared by 85% of the population. It is statistically improbable. And I think most of us here would certainly agree with Marshall Perron, it is statistically improbable, and I think that is our biggest challenge. We need to convince the Liberal and National MPs around Australia that they will not lose votes if they support this issue. What we need them to realise is that they will lose votes if they don't. Oh, there it is, got it mixed up. Anyway, it was, I, I, I mean, it is amusing, um, uh, but it's also infuriating because it's, um, it's true as far as what happened in, um, in New South Wales and uh, in Tasmania. You're probably all familiar with the results of the 2012 news poll that revealed that 82% of Liberal national voters, 84% of Labor voters and 88% of Greens voters supported the right to medically assisted dying. But what that poll also revealed is that voluntary euthanasia is a vote changer, with 29% stating that they would vote against their usual candidate if he or she did not represent their position on this issue. So that is certainly something I'd like to encourage everyone to do in the lead up, as uh, I think Richard's mentioned, uh, Sarah's mentioned, and Philip's also mentioned, um, is to contact your local candidate, the one person you're intending to vote for, be they Liberal, Labor, National, Greens, Independent or other, uh, ask them what their position on medically assisted dying. If they won't support it, tell them you will be changing your vote until they change their position. It doesn't have to be forever, just until we achieve law reform. Let's make 2015 the, the election that sends the strongest message. As Marshall Perron pointed out to Will Hodgman, we're not asking these politicians to lead on the issue, we're asking them to catch up with the needs and wishes of their constituents. The Voluntary Euthanasia Party won't be standing candidates in, or it's unlikely to be standing candidates in the lower house, so, but I'm sure that if your preferred candidate doesn't support voluntary euthanasia, you could find an alternative amongst those on offer who does. But even if you can't bring yourself to change who you vote for in the lower house, perhaps you would consider telling uh, that candidate that you will not vote, uh, you will not be supporting their party in the upper house and intend to vote for the voluntary euthanasia party. One significant difference between last year's Senate election and the upcoming state election is the method of voting, and it's quite different. The method of voting for the New South Wales Legislative Council is optional preferential, which allows you to vote for one or more parties, and most importantly, to direct your own preferences. The major parties will often uh, discourage, will often try and discourage voters from voting for single issue minor parties, saying that your vote will end up with a party not of you choosing, but that can't happen in the um, vote for the upper house in the state election. So by voting one for the voluntary euthanasia party, you will ensure that we have the best possible chance of representing you in the New South Wales Parliament. But after that, you can choose to direct your second preference to any party of your choice. This is the one of the most important things that I'd like to encourage you to um, convey to others if you're talking to them about the Voluntary Euthanasia Party. 
I wish I didn't have to highlight the failings of the Liberal and National Parties, but unfortunately the reality of the situation is, as the others have explained, is that unless we can convince even a small number of Liberal MPs to support the law reform, we will be waiting uh, for possibly another decade or two before we see change. There was an interesting panel discussion held at the Perth Writers' Festival a few weeks ago that some of you may have seen on the ABC's Big Ideas program. It was titled A Good Death. During that discussion, Dennis Altman said that he found it particularly odd in an era when we have a government that constantly tells us about their mandate, they have no compunction whatsoever in ignoring what is very clear expression of public opinion. The host, and Summer, agreed, saying we are electing people who don't actually represent what we think. Dennis went on to say our legislatures are becoming more socially conservative as the population is becoming less socially conservative and that gap is widening. And I'm afraid I think they're right. I know this is primarily a state issue, but we all know that the current federal government has a huge influence on the states. I believe we should also be encouraging Tony Abbott to stand by what he said on ABC's Kitchen Cabinet program last year. In that interview he said, faith has certainly helped to shape my life, but it doesn't in any way determine my politics. <laughs> so he went on to say, you have to accept that there are all sorts of private views that can be passionately held, by, uh, held but in a plurality pluralist, sorry, democracy such as ours, the idea that somehow, that, sorry, the idea that you can somehow make those private views mandatory is bizarre, just bizarre. This last one's good. This is why I think that it is essential that someone of faith understand that while faith is a splendid thing in private life, it can often be quite misleading guide in public life. So they're his words, and I'm like, you know, I think he, he should stick by that or be made accountable. Um, <laughs> so Bernard Salter, social commentator, said last year during uh, the federal campaign, it was actually uh, on the day that the vote compass results were released, that he believed voluntary euthanasia laws will be achieved in the 2020s or 2030s because this is an issue that's going to be championed by the baby boomers. Well, I'm a baby boomer, and I'm not willing to wait till the 2020s or the 2030s. So now you know why I feel strongly about this issue, and I sincerely hope that you'll help me and obviously the committee um, you know, make, let's make voluntary euthanasia the main issue in the election next year. I, you've probably all uh, received one of uh, the brochures that we've just recently had uh, printed and I'd just like to say please feel free to take, we've got plenty and I've even packaged them up into little envelopes of 10 so that if you feel you would know that you could pass on um, these brochures to other people who support, or even if they pick to younger people who may not have even, you know, be thinking of this issue, um, it, that would be a great help to us. So, uh, you know, during the afternoon tea, uh, come and see me or, or any of the others and uh, we'll be able to give you more brochures. Uh, so I would also, um, before I sit down, I'd like to introduce the other members of uh, the Voluntary Euthanasia State Foundation Executive. So let's stand up. My uh, deputy convener is Barry Shine. Where's Barry? Yeah, <laughs> our, our state treasurer is your vice president, Dee Johnson. <laughs> and our state secretary is Gideon Cordova. Uh, uh, up back here, Gideon as well. And our fifth member of the committee is Dr. David Leaf. I don't think David's here today. No? No. So um, please feel free to talk to um, any of us after the meeting and we'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, obviously on voluntary euthanasia, the issue, but uh, in particular any ideas on strategies over the next 12 months. Thanks.